So we've got Ian uh, Central Trophy Development Team who graduated from Mr. Chips and Trailbreaker and became Magnetic Fields. Uh, why the name change? Uh, well, we, we thought Mr. Chips and was a terrible name. We wanted something a bit more sophisticated. <laughs> as simple as that, really. And that was it. Yeah. Is there any inspiration behind Magnetic Fields or was it just. Uh, I, think, I think we wanted to do John Mitchell Jarrett at the time, so it came from the name of one of his albums. Alright, yeah. there you go. Cool, um, and we've got a little slide here of... Like this. Um, I'm being sure that it didn't let him down. Um, taking its influences from the classic split screen racing of Pistol 2. Um, it's a classic game that redefined the um, pseudo-simulation <laughs> racing game. Uh, 3D is quick, the controls are linear, the, com uh, the computer com uh, opponents vary in uh, smartness, if you will. Um, Lotus is rumored to take over nine months to develop, is that right? Um, yeah, I think, I think we spent the best part of the year developing it. I, I started uh, a few weeks before uh, Sean joined me on it. We were uh, working on a shooting game. and. Um, <coughs> It wasn't really going that well, so I, I was designing a, a, a two-player car racing game in the background, doing the graphics, working out how it would work. Uh, and I eventually convinced Sean to to uh, come on board with it. And he, I remember him saying, "If you could do a convincing, fast road routine that would form the basis of the game, then we would do it." So he went away one weekend, came back on Monday, and he he got road working, uh, and then that went on to become uh, Lotus. But originally, it was with a uh, yeah. Porsches in it, and all the graphics were Porsches, in, including the, in the front end. Uh, and then we took it to Gremlin, and uh, Ian had just acquired the license with Lotus, so I had to redraw all the graphics. <laughs> all the, the, the game was essentially the same; it didn't really change, but uh, it was just changing all the graphics were Porsche through the Lotus. Did it take quite a long time to do that? Then, in terms of redrawing? <laughs> I worked a lot of evenings and weekends to get to get that done. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the subsequent games were quicker, but it was it was the best part of the year working on that. I think we took uh, I think it was only I think it was only six six months on the, on the sequel. There's a lot of pressure to do the sequel. I think the sequel was at the time the most successful uh, Gremlin game. Yeah, uh, and then obviously we went to the third one as well. I mean, there's a, I've got a quote here from Sean um, Southern here. Um, recently, he said it was recent, quite recently interviewed. Um, and it says, I remember meeting a boss from Gremlin in his local pub one evening. Um, I was with a friend who was having this test again, and I said it might be a little early. I think we might be a little early. The guy from Gremlin said, No problem, have a drink and put on my time. So we got there ridiculously early as the pub opened at noon, and by the time the guy at Gremlin arrived, we were completely drunk and had run up a, run him up a huge bill. But luckily, he didn't moan all that much. <laughs> is, is that true? Oh, I, I never joined on the pub. I don't drink. I, I've, I've never drank. I, I would always just stay in the office working while they went to the pub. <laughs> That's great. We've got a little movie actually on the um, uh, Fizz movie. Let's have a look if it's going to work. Yay, more technology! Ah, well, so we've got a Fizz movie there, uh, which contained obviously footage for the Lo Lotus promotional material. But in the interest of time, we'll move on to 1991. And it starts with the demise of the 8-bit market, uh, with Amiga sales outstripping the Commodore 64 for the first time. Uh, Grabbing the buttons trend, sometimes under pressure from magazine petitions to bring some, uh, to bring some of the, the conversions from 16-bit uh, titles back to the 8-bit platforms. <laughs> Notice the Switchblade, to, uh, Toyota Celica GT Rally, and Shadow of the Beast, that would appear for Arc and Spectrum and Amstrad fans. We've, got a, we've also got a video here um, because uh, at the time you got Andrew uh, and Sean decided to continue the Lotus series as we said here with Lotus 2, which is just, should be here, yeah, there we go. Um, I mean, do you think this was the best of the Lotus trilogy in your opinion? I think it was the favourite, uh, a lot of people liked it. Um, my my favourite was always the last one because it was the best of both, both games. Um, we just put everything in and everything else we could think of on top of that. Um, but I, I, I think it's, I think generally people like the second one best, I, I think, yeah. It seems to be consensus what we're finding out is that, you know, Lotus 2 is just... Yeah, the only real problem with, with Lotus 3 was that we tried to do too much and it ran a little bit too slowly at times, but, um, but yeah, they all had their own merits. Yeah. Uh, 
plastic, and that uh, includes us nicely on two supercars too as well. Remember this one, guys. Um, magnetic Bills, another sequel to a 1991 gem. Um, Supercars 2 builds upon the original but offered a two player mode and heavily updated the power up system. Um, so, I mean, the output from Magnetic Fields is quite prolific at the time. I mean, we've got Lotus 2 and Supercars 2 making it to market in a short space of time. Um, did, did you guys find that uh, the original engines could be quite, uh, sort of tweaked and used in, in each of those games so to bring them out quickly? Or was the case of engine was... I don't think we were that efficient. I mean, we were always redrawing things or, or rewriting things, and uh, a show was a bit of perfection code. So I don't, I don't think there's anything from, from the original supercars that, that really that we carried over. I think we just redid everything to supercars uh, to. Um, it was actually a, a PC version of it, which is an, an, another update of uh, supercars 2 that we called supercars international. And that was just a, an update uh, and that fixed all the problems that we thought were in supercars 2. Okay. I mean that's a general question for the whole, uh, for, uh, the whole panel here. I mean, how did you guys find the transition stuff from 8-bit machines to 16-bit, was it, was it a big issue for you guys? Was it just a natural progression? Well, Connor, I got a 16-bit once, so I'm happy to jump on the back of that. <laughs> so, maybe the Amiga was fun. You went to three weeks ago, didn't you? No, it took a bit longer, mate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I didn't enjoy the stories for you guys at all? Well, I was enjoying Commodore hardware, pick it to pieces. So, what can it actually do? The document says we can do this, but if you try hard enough, we'll make it do this instead. Maybe do something else instead. Far more fun. Did you guys all find that then? Obviously, you've got a lot of for yourself. Uh, we did, did you have a. We were you, you coding as well at the time? Yeah, we did a lot of, on 16 bit, but Peter was the hardware man, really. I mean, he knew, what he didn't know about the Amiga weren't worth knowing. I mean, uh, I, mean, I just concentrated on the, on the actual game code and stuff. And, uh, Pete did all the hardware tricks with the Amiga, and it was brilliant, wasn't it? <laughs> it was fun, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, we'll move on. We've got a load of things on uh, Switchblade, but we're going to switch straight to Premier Manager. Um, first football management game sim, cashing in on a new cash cow, the Premier League. Um, anyone lose lots of hours to this? <coughs> No, okay. <laughs> All right, moving on then. Um, so we've got Zool as well. Um, any good members of Zool, guys? All looking blankly? <laughs> yeah, 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 very fond memories. It's my, my favourite character. Was your favourite character? Was it one of your favourite games to do then? Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was fun, yeah. yeah. yeah it was, um, I think it was, it was our, our our answer. The, the Amiga needed a, um, a character-based game to compete with Sonic and Mario, yeah. and uh, that's what we set out to do, and built the uh, the Zool world around it, or the nth dimension, as it was known. <laughs> Absolutely awesome game. Yeah, I used to love this. And it never sounds in the early, uh, demo because it doesn't involve the chubby chips. I mean, was that, uh, you know, is it, is it, was that a, a planned thing to actually work with, with the confection brand from the start, or did they approach you? No, no, we, we approached them. Approached um, them? Yeah, I, I had investment in dentists at the time, and I thought it would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, because it says here, in 2013, the Wide magazine listed Zool as one of the 12 games that existed purely just to sell junk food. Have you heard that quote? No, I haven't. Yeah, it was last year. So, any, com any comments from those guys? Or is it just a case of. Not, not, not that I repeat in public. No. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Moving on to Nigel Manson. Uh, another video on YouTube here. Let's see if we can get that up for you. To go back a couple of years, when we first thought, shall we do a racing game? We knew racing games were very popular. And we thought we had the expertise and the programming skills to do a very good racing game. So we said, yeah, let's do a racing game. The next question we asked ourselves, is there a personality? Is there an endorsement we can add to a game that's going to make it even more exciting? We knew Nigel Mansell was doing well in the World Championship at that time. He wasn't World Champion at that time, but we thought he might be. And we started speaking to him. Would he be interested in helping us with our game? He was very interested. He likes computer games. He takes a Game Boy with him wherever he goes. And soon we had Nigel on board as well. So we were there. We knew we were doing a Nigel Mansell racing game. What we're going to do now, James is going to take us around the building. 
and show us how from that point did we develop the game. Okay, uh, now we've decided to go ahead and produce the Maxwell game. We've actually done all the design work. The next stage is to start the programming. We have the computer in which the code is being written. The code that we write ends up in that box over there. That box is our version of the uh, Super Nintendo. It's similar to the one you would have at home, except that what it allows us to do is continually change the program that's working. So this is what's in the cartridge. That code there on that screen translates into this on your Super Nintendo. This is actually the original road that's used in the Nathan Maxwell game. The game is nowhere near complete, but we have the actual basic road. When we were developing the Nigel Mansell game, the road was the most important thing. You've got a smooth and fast road system, particularly with something like the Grand Prix game. To get this far took, took us you know, probably about six or seven months of programming. The next stage was producing the car graphics, the roadside objects, backdrops, all the other support graphics for the game. Um, and that's, that's what we're going to show you next. Everything that you see in the game will at some point have to be drawn. We have to have to draw the car with every wheel position to add realism to the actual game itself. As well as drawing Nigel's car, we have to draw the cars that you're going to be competing against in the game. Can you run the animation there? This is so we can, in the game, we can actually give the impression of a car moving away from you, or you moving up behind another car. How many frames did it take to do that? Um, we originally used eight frames, but I uh, do them up to 16 to make it smooth. Uh, it worked really well. The game isn't just about racing now on tracks though. Another important part of the game is the actual selection and setting up of the car between each of the individual tracks in the game. In this section you can select your tyres, change the airport settings, etc. Below we also see some graphics for the sponsors which we're adding to the car graphics. Anything for realism. Whilst the rest of the team are working on the programming and finishing off the graphics for our game, here in the studio Pat's working on the music and sound effects. Can you go over to some of the music, please, Pat? Once I've composed the music, it's built with tracks, same as this. Okay, could you listen to a sound effect now, please, Pat? In an effort to create as much realism as possible, we asked Reno to... Okay, so in the interest of time, we're going to, uh, we're going to stop that one back there. Right. Um, so you can check that down on YouTube and it basically shows uh, that, uh, young James Norton, now CEO of Foundation 9, and uh, and John Pippen, so I'm going to be super enthused about that, but it's quite popular, so check that out. I was going to have uh, two guys there, I've got to be trying to a few more sequels, so Zul gets a film of in Zul 2, Premier Manager as his second incarnation, and uh, that will be uh, the yeah, Lotus Trilogy of uh, and the season C32. So, um, a question for the panel and the end as well, I mean, what's the reason here for this, for the, there was a slowdown in, in sort of quantity of tactics, was it, was it a case of spiraling budgets and Larger teams and things like that, uh, and it's getting into a long time to go to 60 bits. Larger teams, larger products, that's just the nature of the beast at the time, and it's, it, it's still the same now. As it gets more sophisticated. Yeah. Big, bigger teams, you know, whilst you know, some products did take two years at that time, but uh, there were small teams working for a, for a long period, but now you've got big teams working for a long period. Continuing on there. So, this is the case that this is a as technology develops, it just takes longer for that. That's what's happening in the video game market, yeah. So obviously, in the, in the mobile market, etc., it's somewhat different, but uh, in the video game market, yeah, you've, you've got to have you've got to have lots more artists um, working on products that, uh, that will play on the PS4, etc. Fair enough. Okay. Um, 
coming on to 1995, and uh, we've got a bit of a from May, so I've got the man this is, but it brings us on to actual action. So, And uh, from the first, uh, obviously this, this actress like had a significant investment in technology and mocap. Um, and Bill Powell is one of the biggest, in the, biggest investments in this technology in Europe, is that right? From, from the software, the video game uh, market, yeah. yeah. I think we, we had about the biggest uh, mocap studio. Uh, was, it, was that kind of exciting at the time, the fact that you, you know, you're bringing these things in? Yeah, it was it was very exciting. Wasn't it? We made a commitment to uh, spending a lot of money on the, the capture cameras, etc. And uh, I, I think it paid off at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah so good, good stuff coming out. Um, for the for the audience, obviously, uh, there's a great, really nice making of video um, uh, for the PlayStation um, on YouTube that shows. Uh, so uh, go, go off and search for that, but we're going to skip that for, the, for, the, for this one because obviously we're, we're running over. Um, it was on to 1996, um, and the history of the Gremlins and our panels drawing to a close. So, following the years are anecdotal but interesting. So, we've got um, actual and more premier manager, uh, and more uh, excitement would come in from which is Gremlin bought DMA Design. Um, I'm impressed with DMA because they use the same uh, graphics engine um, as in, in Clan Wars and Wild Metal uh, County and you wanted a collaboration. Uh, you thought they were a first class resource to invest in and our indeed team worked very closely um, for a time with um, so, uh, several tips and uh, backs and forwards between Sheffield and Dundee and the Jim Jabby stories from around this time at all. No, no it, was a, it was an important time for the, for the group. It was, um, it was whilst we were shaping the, um, the business to, to float it on the, on the stock exchange and uh, part of that process was, was building up our development resources and Dave Jones up at DMA was, uh, had a great reputation um, for delivering fantastic product and uh, it, was, it was a great addition to the business. And when, when, when we acquired them they were sort of halfway through the first version of Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, that's, that's what we're getting a uh, picture of that up on here as well. Because um, we've got Race and Chase. Um, so uh, we've got here the early stages of Race and Chase. Uh, there have been no stills in the city version of the mega franchise. Rights have been sold, uh, but they could be part of this acquisition. Is, is that right? Because the Chef have been the home of Grand Theft Auto? No, no, it was already, it was already sold to Bertelsmann. Yeah, yeah. So we knew that anyway. So. Fair enough. That, that would have been cool though, wouldn't it? You know, it's like a GTA redevelopment to Sheffield, given how the franchise is right now. Yeah. It may not have happened though. Through that. And so, you know, there's, well, there's GTA right there. Dave Jones there. Love the picture of Dave Jones up there. Um, so, someone that's excited, Ian. Uh, about the acquisition of DMA. Dane Jones, the founder of DMA and often referred to as a Spielberg and Gaming, joined Gremlin as a creative director. He did oversee development of, uh, of some of the most uh, appealing titles of DMA's history. One had to prove it controversial back early on. And that was <coughs> not on here. Well, it was Body Harvest, basically. Do you remember, do you remember Body Harvest? Is it? Yeah, it was a um, Nintendo 64 time. Yeah. Um, it was actually um, supposed, originally it was supposed to be a Nintendo first party product. Yeah, and the uh, right back it was Ultra 64 when it was being developed, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it became the N64. Um, so Nint uh, Nintendo dropped the MA and the game, and the game for being too violent, is that, or, or at least they tried to, according to this, is that? Sorry, they... So uh, apparently, uh, where are we? Nintendo apparently tried to drop uh, DMA and Body Harvest uh, because they thought it was too bad at the time. Is that, yeah. is that yeah, right? It didn't quite fit in with, the, with their uh, portfolio products. Uh, and it, and, it, and it, they were probably right to do that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's some, I think some problems out there, Robert, isn't it? Nick? You can guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think 
Okay. I think your sandwich is ready. I think it is. <laughs> so I think there's some roses there. I've already harvested. You can get hold of them now. So. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Uh, okay, moving on to 1997 then. Um, so we've got a record profit of 3.3 million during 97 and a record turnover.
but Long Time the Run wasn't my favourite. I've got to give a selfie. Yoga. Nope. Yeah. Again. <laughs> it's Amy Laskin. <laughs> it's actually monsters. Tell me about it. Give us one word to describe the game that doesn't get too much away. If I say something wrong, I'll get sued, or if I even lose my job, so... <laughs> I can't, so... Um, what is the key difference to developing today to 20, 30 years ago? You, you talk about spiral and costs, but if you were going to produce an iOS game to today, which on the surface seems like a simple thing to do, yeah, it's not, because it takes years, you look at these games like Fez or whatever that take forever, or they in their PC games, it take forever to develop. What is the key, big difference, the big time sink in our game? I found that it's the PC product, but what we normally do is we do the engine on a PC and the console, and we develop on a PC, and then it just works on the console. And if you do develop like that, they're the easiest ones. As soon as you go to the console, the rest is a bit pain. They're usually better for profiling consoles, but that's about it. So PC is the best one. But you know, as far as I know, I've only done one PC game, that was Realms of the Haunted, and I'll never do that again. So, so I'm thinking again. Wacky Racers on Dreamcast, and we had a PC oh, one. Yes. Never got released, it was just used for development. So. Key difference I find is that it's no longer really possible to, even though the iOS and mobile devices, it's no longer possible to do everything yourself to build your own the graphics, the artwork, the coding. Uh, so, you know, really do have to have a very talented group of people around you to be able to work to get anything decent done. I've got nothing to add to that. <laughs> anyone else? Any more questions from anyone? I was going to add one more thing. I did enjoy yeah. working on a drink cast. Uh, the problem with that one is pirated to hell, so we didn't get any money to release the product on it. Was that the main problem with the Dreamcast thing? I mean, that, 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 that was part of its downfall, the fact that you know, it was just so easy to cheat. I don't know, I just I remember right, when we were doing Wacky Racing, I remember that being the easiest to program and easiest to do everything with. And they gave us a system called Katana before the early days, and the SDK was absolutely rubbish. So I went off and made my render twice as fast as the SDK. <laughs> from me, no one writes an assembler anymore. I miss that. <laughs> I did a bit on PS2. I remember on that one, but that was hard work. Yeah, but what was each of you down the line, which was your favourite Gremlin game that you ever worked on? <coughs> I've already told you, so it was your favourite game of all time, so it's uh, not on the run. It has to be Realms of the Home too. It was actually a really good experience in that. Probably Lotus 3. Lotus 3. I liked all the ones that made money. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one closest to my heart is Zorn and uh, closely followed by a thing on a spring. Amazing games. Well, that's it. Any more questions, guys? Well, that's it. Thank, 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 you, thank you for coming up, guys, and get it off the gremlins. Um, thank you very much. So, um, later on, if you check your uh, website, um, Plano, should I say, there we have got some of the guys doing some signings in the first hall on the left as you come in at the back corner there. Um, I'll get Andy to uh, do an announcement on the, on the tannoy, but for now, we're uh, going on the night. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to hang around for the, uh, for the next uh, talk, that's in about 10 minutes' time. Thank you.